Roger Williams University is hosting a crisis management seminar on May 3rd at their Providence campus. Crises, whether a natural disaster, cyber attack, or financial instability, can have severe repercussions if not handled properly. This is where crisis management plays a pivotal role. Join Roger Williams' MBA students and expert speakers to learn how to prepare for the unexpected. The program is totally free and open to the public. You can register online at rwu.edu slash events slash crisis dash management dash symposium. All this week on the Bartholomew Town Podcast, a special report. Rhode Island's housing crisis. Kicking off today with a conversation with two of Rhode Island's leading voices in this area, Crossroads Rhode Island's Karen Santilli and One Neighborhood Builders' Jennifer Hawkins. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Two very uh, active and important voices in this conversation. And they are Karen Santilli, Crossroads Rhode Island, and Jennifer Hawkins, One Neighborhood Builders. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So I guess th- this is such a, um, you know, it's a question that is that that's so broad that there's really no way to answer it. But what is the key factor from your perspective that is impacting the housing crisis in Rhode Island that impacts those who are unhoused and those who are trying to, you know, pay rent, those who are trying to purchase, whatever the case may be? If there's one thing that jumps out to each of you, what would it be? supply. I could not agree more with that, Karen. It's absolutely a supply challenge that we're facing. Yeah, that seems to be the, the and, and as a result uh, of that working backwards, then zoning and sort of opinions that go into influencing zoning and, and things of that sort. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have, it's, it's actually, if I was allowed two words, I would have said supply and demand <laughs> because <laughs> right. we have we have people who um have vouchers um there are lists of people waiting at all income levels and at all uh area area median income categories so when we talk about the supply of housing we're talking about every group and it's easier in Rhode Island, and Jen can speak to this probably a lot more eloquently than I can, but it's easier in Rhode Island to build housing at certain levels than it is at other levels. And so because we've done so little production for households that have extremely low income, 30% AMI, 40% AMI, people living on disability income, those are the groups of folks that that Crossroads builds housing for and and one neighborhood builders builds housing for that we we just simply have not been building enough in those for those folks at all for years. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely elaborate on that point. Um, and Karen is completely right that it is fundamentally a supply problem, and the production of housing, as Karen says, is needed up and down the income spectrum. We need housing at all levels. But in order for households who are extremely low income, they're facing homelessness, in order for them to be able to afford the rent, they need a rental subsidy. It's simply not possible to build housing and pay for the ongoing expenses of operating housing for persons who can only pay to $300 a month in rent, if that, right? Like just simply the math doesn't work. The cost of taxes and insurance and water and sewer and basic maintenance exceed what a person who is extremely low income can afford and pay in rent. And that delta is is growing every single year. And so while we can build more housing and that it's, you know, fundamental supply and demand ideas that will relieve pressure on rents when you increase production. For those people who are at the lowest level of the income spectrum, they're always going to need a rental subsidy. And that is a truth that unfortunately people have not been able to reckon with. It is just an absolute truth. They are never going to be able to afford (laughs) um, the rent that it takes to keep 
um, the, these apartments in good condition. And um, they deserve to have quality housing. And we deserve, they, we have an obligation to provide that rental subsidy to them. What is, is there any data on the number or percentage of the population that would require a significant rental subsidy in order for the entire equation to work out? I don't have that data at my fingertips. I don't know, if, Karen, if you do. I don't, but I know it's not the exact same thing. But when we look at people, households experiencing homelessness, pre-COVID, on average, about 20% were extremely high need income, I mean, high need um, households. So that means generally they would need a rental subsidy as well as, as supportive services to maintain their housing. Post COVID, we've seen that number increase to about 25%. And that's a, an average that's been in Rhode Island as well as nationally. So if you take the entire population of households experiencing homelessness, about 25% of that needs permanent supportive housing. So that's housing for extremely low income, plus supportive services to make sure that they're able to sustain and be successful in that housing. From here, we look at a situation where we're coming out of, or is still certainly in it, but a crisis of the unhoused that is you know, from an economic standpoint, we look at that sort of lower tier income. How much of a foundation for addressing the entire housing crisis is the, the crisis of the unhoused? In other words, if you stabilize that with shelter, with affordable housing, with the appropriate vouchers, is that going to help stabilize the rest of the equation up all the way even to the luxury level? I'm not I'm not sure about that, but I guess I would say that when we're able to deploy solutions for households who are, quote unquote, the hardest to house, those solutions will always work for the other individuals, right? So I do think that it makes sense as a uh, philosophy to prioritize and focus on individuals who are most vulnerable, and it will just automatically kind of help others. But I think that the idea that we just need to produce a lot more housing um, and that the increase of the supply of housing will help all bands of individuals. Um, and you know, we haven't been producing housing at the scale and density that we need for decades. This is not a, certainly a new problem, but as household composition has changed, as the way that we think about um, housing, the, uh, working from home, it has all of these issues have collided and brought about the crisis that we're in today. You know, I, um, I wrote an op-ed um, to the journal. Sorry, the siren's going by. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> in 2015, and I happened to come across it a few weeks ago when I was cleaning my office, and it blew me away how I could have written this today, and it would still be true. And the main point of it was, if we don't design housing and programs to house those that have the highest level of need, the chronic homeless, those with mental and co-occurring, you know, physical mental health issues, where we will be having this conversation in another eight years. We have to address the immediacy of the unsheltered right now. We have to address the crisis, but we cannot stop talking about, and we, we cannot stop, well, we should stop talking and do more, but <laughs> we have to address the housing crisis now. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were talking about converting hotels into permanent supportive housing at the beginning of the pandemic. Had we done that, like some of our neighboring states, we wouldn't have the crisis that we have right now. We might not have it. So uh, we need to really move forward. It's a both and. It's, it cannot be an either or. It cannot be, well, we're going to just address the crisis. It's winter. We have unsheltered. Get them into a warming center. And that's it. We're all set. That's not the case. The only way to end homelessness is to help people get into housing, period, the end. And and and, and I'm thrilled that there seems to be more um, uh, interest in, and um, 
conversation around this and more funding for sure, but we cannot take our foot off that pedal at this point. How much of this is NIMBYism? Because we all remember the Cranston situation or the Nilo Hotel. And look, it's a statewide, it's not just, I don't want to single out just those municipalities, but they kind of singled themselves out at one point public in terms of public facing. But even here in, in Elmwood, you know, I remember a, a conversation around building small, you know, pop-up style units. And there was an idea for sort of a campus, if you will. And there was community resistance to that idea. So uh, how much of this comes down to people just saying, all right, we've got to work together? I, I guess, you know, NIMBYism is certainly alive and well. However, I think that with um, good design, good community engagement, um, high quality management, it is absolutely overcomable um, or surmountable. <laughs> um, you know, I think of two projects that One Neighborhood Builders just got it permitted, one in Central Falls and one in Cumberland. On Broad Street, both of them, one and a half miles apart. <laughs> um, and in, in Central Falls, um, we had a community engagement meeting and we heard loud and clear that they wanted to prioritize housing apartments over parking. And we were, were going to be doing a 44 unit development with three parking spaces. They just absolutely, there were more units the, the more important. Um, you know, it was the highest rate of COVID in the state per capita. And a lot of that has to do with overcrowded living situations. And so they are just, that was their priority. Now, a mile and a half down the road in Cumberland, we are going to be producing 47 apartments at 69 parking spaces. There, we had a similar community engagement process and the community was Really, it stressed how important it was for them to be able to have adequate parking. They um, really have, have seen the problem with a lot of uh, street parking and, and that, that was important to them. And we addressed it, right? So I think that we have to, as developers, be open to different solutions depending on the communities who work. It's not a one size fits all. Um, engage them early and be able to say, hey, come look and see what we've done. Hmm. Let me debunk the myths around what low income affordable housing looks like. Let me talk to you about our quality management. And in my experience, we've always been able to overcome that initial pushback. We've never had a project be stopped because of that. I think that there are really rational, well-intentioned communities. They just, you have to be able to negotiate and listen to their concerns and respond to them without just kind of, uh, you know, saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And and I, I just don't think that that's helpful dialogue. Yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. It's sort of a meet, meet in the middle type of approach because it does become very quickly, you know, this back and forth, this this ping ponging of barbs and, you know, oh, this city, you know, they're, they're, they don't want to help the homeless or these people, all they want to do is you know, change the scope of our neighborhood. And then you've got mayors going back and forth and it just turns into like a sideshow that does zero for anybody. I think there are so many really positive examples of neighborhoods that have been developed by organizations like One Neighborhood Builder and Crossroads that we can look to for success. Jen just named two that will be successful, I'm sure, based on other housing they've built. Crossroads has built housing. We have 104 a community of 104 family apartments in North Kingstown. Um, and it's been wonderful. The community has been wonderful. We have uh, a 14 unit home in West Warwick. So we have examples throughout the state where we have very positive relationships with communities. I think, um, you know, unfortunately part of the, part of the NIMBYism is, um, is a fear that when we can prove that that fear isn't going to be reality, um, then good things can happen. Really well said. Um, last area here that I had in mind was coordination at the state level. Look, I've been calling it the fall of Saul. Josh Saul's a nice guy. He's been on the podcast. Apparently, he's a talented electronic musician, seems to have a lot of policy understanding, had zero ability to communicate on the radio, uh, in terms of just within organizations, tying people together. I think that's a fair statement. I'll make it anyway. And it seems like that's what caused 
uh, that breakdown there. Stefan Pryor, on the other hand, is quite the communicator. I mean, I, you could probably just let him talk for like an hour and a half straight, and that's that's a compliment. Um, do, are you comfortable with where we're heading right now with the Department of Housing or just in general at the statewide level? Do you feel like we have the people or trending in the right direction for coordination and communication between agencies, between nonprofits, between activists, between the media and the public as a whole. Well, we go first, Jen. <laughs> I, would, I would say, um, you know, there's different facets to this, but overall, from the state's perspective, absolutely, we're trending in the right direction. There's more. Um, committees, there's more information gathering, there's more funding available, there's more conversations around housing, what is affordable housing, what is uh, housing for the homeless, how are they different, what's permanent supportive housing, I mean lots of good people are asking a lot of questions trying to understand all of this complex issue. Um, I would say that we need to keep moving in that direction, that trend needs to continue, um, I look forward to working with the new Secretary of Housing. I, 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 I look forward and I would suggest that he be transparent and continue working with the providers and, and the developers. Uh, we've been doing this work for a long time. It's wonderful that people are now listening and putting money on the table, but let's work together collaboratively with trust to get this done because it's really, it's complex, but it's not that complex. Mm. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I would really echo what Karen had to say. Um, you know, with hindsight, I think that Josh um, had significant headwinds, right? I don't think that he was set up for success. And I don't think that he was necessarily the, the right fit for that position. We have an opportunity for a fresh start. And I, you know, believe that you got to be able to have kind of an inside game and an outside game. And, you know, I think that um, Stefan Pryor certainly knows how government works. And I think that is going to be really helpful. I think that um, to Karen's point, you know, the providers, developers have been at this work for a long time and we really do know what we need. And housing is the zeitgeist, right? It's like, everyone's talking about housing, but we aren't new to this game. And we really, I think, have not had the advocacy at the state house that we've needed. And we haven't had the resources. Um, you know, for a lot of things, it doesn't come down to, you know, money, but, in the case of housing, actually, um, a lot of it does come down to just not having adequate capital to do the job. Jennifer Hawkins, One Neighborhood Builders, Karen Santilli, Crossroads, Rhode Island, two rock stars in this space and two people who just understand the issues at play on a day-to-day -day basis and on a macro level. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. The legalization of recreational cannabis that went into effect last year can open doors for your career. If you are already in the industry or wondering what is the best path to break into the cannabis field, well, the University of Rhode Island has a program to help you become highly competitive in numerous areas of the cannabis industry. Fully accredited by URI's College of Pharmacy, the certificate program is 100% online, and it can be completed in two semesters. The next application deadline for the summer 2023 session is April 4th, and courses start on May 9th. You can learn more at uri.edu slash online slash cannabis, or give them a call at 401-874-5280. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com employers.